I mean, you're selling what the product will make you feel, not necessarily just the products. That's why creating a brand and creating a story is so vital because people don't just buy products. They buy the ideas behind them or the memories or the inspiration or whatever values that are inherent to it. As do I. Like, I don't want to do something just for the sake of doing it. So for me, this is a passion project. Like, these are things that I believe in. Welcome to Fruiting Body Podcast with your host, Brendan O'Neill. We are a medicinal mushroom company located in Phuket, Thailand, and Fruiting Body is sharing the stories with people living and working on the island of Phuket. Today, we have a lovely guest. This is Mika Wassanar. I was going to say price, but we'll leave that out. Anyways, we'll continue. Uh, Mika is uh, owning and operating the company called si- uh, Siamese uh, Care. Sorry, is that Siamese correct? Siamese Dreams. Siamese Dreams. Sorry, I stuttered on my own. Siamese Dreams. And she's doing luxury p- pajamas and uh, loungewear as well. Uh, we're going to be discussing with Mika her two decades in the fashion industry, from manufacturing to purchasing to textiles to even owning and operating her own online business and how she got through the current situation. Um, so let's dive right into it as we do with Mika's journey and start back as her childhood in beautiful and the same country as me, Canada. Thank you, Mika, for joining us. Thank and um, yeah, let's just start back at, back in Canada and uh, start in your childhood in Montreal. How was it? Was it a typical childhood? Where did you go to school? And tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, thank you for having me on the podcast. Um, so as a fellow Canadian... Um, yeah, growing up in Montreal was an ideal, safe childhood. Um, it just gets really cold, so we get really brutal winters. Um, my parents are both immigrants, so my mom is Japanese and my father is Dutch, and they decided, let's move to Canada, let's start all over, and yeah, it was pretty normal, I guess, growing up, aside from, I don't know, being an immigrant and having to go to French school, so that was a bit weird. So went to French school. Um, Montreal was great as a multicultural city, which I really enjoyed. I remember going to Chinatown on Saturdays or we had a little Italy. Um, Obviously, we spoke French, so there was definitely European influence. Which area were you living? I lived there as well. I was on René Levesque. So I mostly grew up in the West Island and then later on like NDG and Westmount. Oh, okay. So more West. Yeah, Not I was so getting, much downtown. I was getting closer to Westmount. I think Atwater is kind of that borderline. Yeah. Once you cross Atwater, <laughs> then it's like, oh, it get, well, it gets a bit hairy on that side. Well, it kind of depends, but I think things are like, yeah. I mean, it's it's a little more upmarket now, I'd say, Atwater. And you have like a beautiful market and you have all these great things. So, yeah, Canada is amazing. It's safe. It's beautiful. It's, you know, it's 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 full of nature. But it's also a little bit small and a little bit boring. And there was something in me that I always had this urge to travel, explore. So I knew straight away, as soon as I started working and making money, I was always drawn to fashion. And, you know, even when I was a kid, I remember watching shows about fashion (laughs) and like reading Vogue. And like that was my escape, I guess. I was just really into the imagery, the craftsmanship, um, the creativity. So I was really always inspired by that so I always knew okay I want to travel and I like nice clothes and did, did you end up going to school for this as well I like did. in Canada or I where did, did you end so up in going? Montreal there's a like a fashion institute called Collège La Salle and I studied I actually studied fashion marketing so I studied the business side of fashion first um yeah and I and I took the shortest course possible because I was like I just want to go to school and make money and just start working right away I didn't want to like get a master's or, you know, there's, I was just, school was not for me. I just want to be, didn't want to be there for four years. No, and, I was like, yeah. what's the quickest route out of here? And I just want to work and I just want to travel. So that and was, was me. this quick out of Montreal? So after you finished yeah. your education, yeah, you it was totally right fast. over to China from there. Um, well, the first job I got was working as a buyer for a retailer and it was actually a really big chain of retail shops at the time, but it was like, really at this point where it was just so old and outdated and they were trying to find like a younger, more fun and interesting concept. 
So this concept, I was asked to kind of help build it with some other people. And one of the first things was to uh, come to Thailand and to source product and to manufacture. So that was my first trip to Thailand when I was about 20. It was like, and it was culture shock. I was like, I can't say that I liked Bangkok the first time I arrived. I was like, coming from Montreal and coming from Canada. I mean, I'd been to Asia before. I'd been to Japan because my mom's Japanese, but Thailand was so chaotic to me. And I was like... Yeah, and it's... You find... Um, I, I had that same experience when I first landed in, in Taiwan. There's also a smell. Yeah. It's a, an assault on all my senses. Right. And it's hot. It's smelly. I'm sweaty. It's loud. Yeah. It's like all my senses were assaulted. But then that kind of fades away after a couple months. Like that smell of the sewers you forget about and like... Yeah. And it's interesting. Yeah. And I think... It took me two to three trips before I was like, oh, I get it now. And I surrendered to the rhythm and I was like, oh, I see the magic. I get it. And it was from then on, I was like, oh, my God, I love Thailand. And um, actually, the, my boss at the time had a, a home in Kamala and he would rent it out or he would stay there. And then every now and then he's like, oh, I don't have any guests. Would you like to go? And I was like, yes. And then I would just, you know, have the opportunity to come to Kamala. And I think that's why we gravitated towards Phuket and towards mm. Kamala because I had been coming here <laughs> like two for decades. Years. So yeah. when you when you would come to Bangkok, you're primarily there for business. Yes. And then you'd be able to get that trip down south yeah. to Kamala as well. Yeah. What year are we talking? We're talking like 2000, 2000. 2001, 2003. 2000. I wasn't here for tsunami. Correct. So, and then, yeah, that just continued. And then when I lived in Shanghai, which was 2006, 2008, I would also come to Thailand because I was like, I need to see the ocean and I need mm. to see green. And I was like, yeah, that was my, my escape from, from Shanghai, which was not easy. Well, let, let's connect that, that part together as well. So your, your first big job is you're working for a retailer and yeah. you're doing, it's, it's kind of like purchasing essentially. Yeah, so so you're, you're, purchasing. you're looking for suppliers. Yeah. So we're purchasing, we're purchasing ready-made goods, but we're also, you know, there's better margins when you develop your own product. So you go directly, you source the fabric, you source, you know, you put together a design package and um, you find the factories to deliver the goods. So we were Was doing that, that your responsibility in terms of like locating the factories as well? Or were you more responsible, like on the quality control side and going to actually, you know, have boots on the ground? Um, because it was a small company, I was kind of doing everything, yeah. which was great. And actually, I, I enjoy that. I enjoy looking for fabrics i enjoy going to factories like i like the the nerdy side of it like i like touching the fabric i like knowing how things are made how much things weigh how much things cost so the engineering side behind the garments mm -hmm. so i was really lucky as well that i always had you know bosses that were really generous with their time and their experience so i got to learn a lot and you just learn everything on the spot you just learn and you see the machines and you see everything you see the manufacturing and yeah, I was really passionate about that, but I was also really passionate about design and, and you know, what's on trend and you know, what's current in music and how does that reflect on, you know, mm -hmm. lifestyle. And so I'll, it's all those things, I suppose, mixed together. So this, this part of um, the job you still were looking to expand on in terms of the design aspect of it, is that what led you to China? And is that how we you're connecting Bangkok to China? Or what were the next steps for you after this first uh, initial job? So we, yeah, we went back to Canada and our retail shops were in Canada. And at that point, Thailand was not our only place of production. Um, so obviously we still manufactured in China, India. Um, and actually China is probably, it still is like number one for where you want to make things. Because the machines, like, you know, everything is is probably more developed. It's probably better financed. So you're, you know, there's the factories there are, you know, next level. It's just another field. So the plan was to open a design studio in Shanghai and also possibly open retail stores there. Um, so, yeah, they said, do you want to go to China? Do you want to help us build a design team with some local designers? And also, you know, source and create. And, yeah, so it was... Of course I said yes. I was young and I never lived abroad yet and I but saying that and I I don't think I would go back now but as a young person um it was great professionally. I think I made really good experiences. I learned a lot. I learned a lot about myself like mm -hmm. living outside of my comfort zone like 
not speaking the language and what about being like, alone because also i lived in china i think we have some similarities there we both lived in thailand china and canada um when you first landed in china do you have any stories that you can recall or just like oh what the f was well, that I or mean, just something that might have been you know mm, well, wasn't the greatest experience or, or even something that was memorable uh first working in china well i think i'd, I'd been living Okay, well, working in China was different because I, I just to visit factories was in and out. So that was fine and I enjoyed it and I enjoyed visiting the rest, like all the different provinces in China. But when I moved to China and I lived there full time, I found it very isolating and I felt like I, yeah, I felt it hard. I felt it hard to really connect with, you know, my coworkers. Like I was trying to be funny and sarcastic and like it just fell on dead ears and I was like nobody thinks I'm funny and nobody's laughing and it was just a culture shock in that sense I thought I found it hard to connect to people I eventually found some friends you know from all over the world but one of the, <laughs> the strangest and maybe like I don't know kind of saddest thing is I I had my iPhone stolen and my well not my iPhone but it was like a little flip phone thing and my iPod was stolen as I was listening to music walking to the station I was like, oh, yeah, what a great song. And then stop playing. I was like, what happened? And I looked down and my headphone string was dangling in the wind. Someone just pickpocketed my iPod as I was going to the train. And that happened like I had a phone pickpocketed. And so I just, again, maybe I was like naive mm. Canadian. I was like, I didn't lock my door growing up. So <laughs> going to China was like maybe I was a little green, let's say. And that's so. that's strange. Like, um, I don't know if they've cleaned it up in China, but when I was there, I, I never felt threatened but i don't know i was dating a brazilian so she was kind of always like with the bodyguard <laughs> she'd always like catch me she's like come on don't wear your watch out look up like, yeah because they're very young for sure for right? sure so, and i wasn't and i'm no you know and i was like oh <laughs> and i can't do those things so and then how many years did you spend in china from which year to 2006 which year? to 2008 and did you pick up the language living a there a little bit. bit i mean i had lessons but yeah. i think i also Deep in my heart, I knew I wasn't going to stay, so I didn't invest as much of my energy as I mm -hmm. probably should have. So I can sort of get by, and I remember giving directions to the taxi driver and, like, knowing what to order and stuff like that. So just basic survival. Yeah, and I mean, I think mo most foreigners living in China, that's, I, well, I was there six years, so I got a little bit, I got to the point where I could do apartments and rent right, okay. at that level. Um, if you give me enough beers, I think I'm fluent. <laughs> <laughs> is your accent like Shanghainese or is it like it's Beijing? Shang, it's like Shenzhen. Oh, so it's like Southern. Yeah, like okay. Sh 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 sure, sure, sure. No, that's not, oh, okay. Not like that's this. like Northern. Yeah, that's Northern. Beijing. Yeah, no, it's more Southern. I, I'm okay. I, I, if I run into Chinese, I, I can hold my own. The problem is understanding them, right? Because they all have different dialects yes, and they can get. They speak so I can understand what I'm saying, and I just try to say it in like three different ways till I see it click, and I'm like, all right, you got it. <laughs> Um, when you're living in China and you're visiting different factories, not only in China, but also in Bangkok, what are the differences between those factories, not just in terms of like culturally, but also like the quality and the production or just the general experience? Well, China, like I said before, is just on another level. Like everything is bigger, faster, more modern. So, but that also comes at a price. I think your quantities have to be bigger as well. So... But there's some techniques that are just not available anywhere else, and like as you know, um, and culturally, it's people are quite serious in China. Like there's not that much room for playfulness and silliness, mm -hmm. and whereas that's why I love Thailand because everyone is you know smiling, or there is a place for you know mystical or joy or all these things that I find really curious. But I also find really lovely about thailand but they move a lot I, i've done some business in, in yeah, thailand sure. it's, and, it's and china pace. and it's a complete like, <laughs> something survive. that should take like a half an hour takes like three days well that's and why then. because there's like all these religious holidays or there's all these things that need to be observed and but that's one of the reasons why i left china and i left fashion because i was i kind of fell out of love with the idea that everything had to be faster, everything had to be cheaper, everything had to be. And I just got really, I don't know, I guess I kind of lost touch with it all. I mean, I wasn't necessarily working in the high end and I wasn't in the low end. I was kind of in the middle, but I did experience like, you know, 
moments where I'm like, you know, is it really necessary to really just negotiate these pennies? And but it does, it matters because if you're doing hundreds of thousands of units, you know, mm -hmm. a mill of millis cent matters. Um, but did, did you stay in the industry? So after 2008, when you left China, did you go back to Canada or at this point? I is went, this when you went to London? I went back to Canada for a year and then eventually moved to London um, to, yeah, to be with my now husband. Okay. Yeah. So then I'm assuming you guys met before? We met in Shanghai, actually. Oh, ah, okay. Yes. So that was always, I mean, out of all the, I guess, difficulties or challenges, I did get to meet him there. So I guess that was predestined yeah and now you're back in Phuket so yes. you, you're in London from 2007 I'm guessing to 2014 2008 until to, sorry 2008 to until two now in a way because we still split our time between okay. London and here so at which point did you now I'm assuming because you, you, you're getting married you're having kids maybe you've taken a step back from the design and fashion but now you've kind of went full-blown back into it over the past um maybe I'll let you explain that part of how you got back into it and how this all kind kind of came full circle. Yeah, I mean, obviously, after I had my daughter, I kind of took a step back. Yeah, I was still working, but more as a consultant and just freelancing um, in design studios in London. Um, and then, yeah, I just wanted to have a different pace of life. As my daughter grew up and was in school, I had a little more time on my hands. And I just kind of started thinking, yeah, I would love to just create something um, that's kind of anti-fashion in a way. Like I really wanted to do something that didn't have to look at trends and it wasn't about, you know, fast fashion. It was about slow fashion. It was about, okay, what do people wear at home and what do, you know, it doesn't matter if it's on trend because for me, I just want to make things that are timeless, you know, so it's. Is it beautiful? Do I love it? Okay, good. Is it made ethically? Are we using better fabric? So all the questions that, or all the rules that I had to follow in my previous career, I kind of wanted to like scrap them. And I, I just didn't want to do any of those things. I just wanted to do something. I wanted to pay fair wages and use better factories, use better fabrics, use, you know, trying to be ethical and conscious about what fabrics I'm using, like mm -hmm. trying to minimize anything that's not biodegradable. So all the things that I felt were wrong about what I was doing in the past, I felt like, okay, now's the time to do it. And because we were based here and because, I don't know, I guess I just slightly obsessed with Thailand in some ways. Like I am in awe of its beauty, of its charm, of its mystical history and its quirkiness. Is this so, where your design concepts kind of derive from as well? Yeah. For sure. Um, so, so I'm assuming the clothing you're wearing now is what you 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 carry. Yeah. So this was our first print collection, and my idea was to. So every every day when I wake up, the first thing I see is like banana palms. So my association to Thailand is obviously beaches and everything else, but it's also green and lush and and that's how, th yeah, the vision I had in my mind. And I asked my friend Daisy, who's an oil painter and she's also a chef, to paint these banana palms for me and then we created a pattern so that was another intention was to just collaborate with female artists and just commission them to do beautiful artwork that's inspired by Thailand and in a way timeless like you can mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what season you're in it's like it does there is no season are, are you so. doing the design as well or is, are you kind of like actually doing the design by yeah. hand or are so you I usually just draw on illustrator so I draw the design and then I work with the factories and create a fit and a pattern. So let, let's, let's walk through kind of the process of des um, essentially from concept to production where it's into the retail store. Yeah. Um, as a, well, as a business owner of, of, of these luxury goods, you want to start, let's say a, a new uh, pajama line. Where do you start from? What's your process? So the first step is, I guess, well, simultaneous, simultaneously, I was thinking of the branding and as well as sourcing the fabric. So for me, it was about finding the right fabric. So I really wanted a really lightweight, super soft cotton. Um, and I, that was hard to find. And finding the right factory that can do the type of finishing that I was looking for. So garments, there's so many different machines, so many different finishing. So I, you know, for pajamas, you want piping or you want French seams or flat seams. 
um, the type of buttons you want. So I guess it's finding the factory that can deliver that for you. And then, but also for me, it was the fabric. It's like when you're a chef, like you have to find the right ingredients before you start anything. So once you have that, and then the styling is quite secondary actually, because for me, again, it's the print that is making the most noise. So I wanted really simple styles that can be worn in or out and you can style them separately or together. So yeah, I just wanted something that reflected the lifestyle that I was living. Um, and I guess it was a bit self-indulgent. Like, I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I was like, I really want nice pajamas and I can't find them. Yep. And I want something made in Thailand because a lot of the stuff that's available here is either made in China or made in Vietnam or a lot of stuff is actually made in Indonesia. So And Bangladesh as well, right? Yeah, like anywhere. Like Thailand still has a manufacturing sort of industry but it's actually the workers and the workmanship is more expensive than the other countries so a lot of people if you're big you'll go elsewhere yeah so in terms of like labor costs and absolutely so thailand is yeah it's not cheap to manufacture here now when when you're starting that process of going to source these factories is it's not like china in the sense where you can just jump kind of on alibaba or maybe uh go through let's say a um uh, like a, a Canton Fair type yeah. of exhibition website and find contacts. What What is your process to find those factories in Thailand? Because I could imagine that'd be a little bit more difficult than finding in China. It is. It's really hard. And uh, actually, the way that I did is I, I kept all my contacts from when I first came to Thailand 20 years ago. And I've become friends with a lot of my suppliers and I've been to their weddings. And, you know, I've 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 really connected with them and through their help and through their networks was I able to find the right contacts. So it's it's about personal relationships, it's about personal networks. It would be impossible to find on your own if you're not Thai, I think. Mm -hmm. So like yeah. where would you even start? I mean, bes yeah, I mean besides Google, I mean, I'll, I'll give an example. Like we're doing some manufacturing of, of processing uh, into in mushroom powders into capsules. And like, yeah, I could find a few suppliers in Bangkok, but like, you got to get online and then you talk to them and then you write one word and they reply three days later. And it, it just was a nightmare. And every single, and everyone knows that when you Google anything in Thailand and you get on Google and there's a phone number, that phone number never works <laughs> ever. It's true. <laughs> I don't know why it's there. <laughs> I don't know why it's there, but those phone numbers never work. That's true. And you have to kind of find whoever is in charge's line yep. and then go from there. That's what I noticed about dealing with factories everything we do is online. Like yeah. we don't even email each other. It's like just line. line do, 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 yeah. do. So we're deciding what trim, what button, like what delivery date, everything's online. Are you using a lot of different uh, group chats as well to kind of uh, get involved in that or is, is it more simplified? Well, what I just keep it simple. Like yeah. one is for the factory, one is for, you know, my assistant in regards to sales or anything else. Yeah. So yeah, just keep it as simple as possible. Uh, you know, and w one to talk to the artwork designers and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, Thailand is, is not open as much, I'd say, as China for business in that sense. There are some fairs. There are manufacturing fairs. And, of course, you could, I guess, sort of look on Google and try and find things. But for me, I was, yeah, I was just really grateful that I found the ones that I was looking for. And so my friends would narrow it down to the ones that they thought. I, I would tell them the list of things that I was looking for, and they would narrow it down. And then I would go visit them. And then I would decide, okay, this is the right one for me. Um, I'm going to continue with this person. Mm -hmm. um, was, so yeah. was it difficult to get to these? I mean, to get to these places, because as you know, in China, like uh, you could have factories out in Kunming, yeah, and then you got to fly. I mean, from here to Kunming, let's call, let's call it a six hour flight at least. Yeah, and then you could be in another car for four hours. <laughs> is it like that in Thailand, or is kind of everything around Bangkok and it's easy yes to and, get to? Yes and no. A lot of people have their main showrooms and f like sample rooms and factories in Bangkok but the bigger they get obviously Bangkok is limited on space so the further out they go so they can be anywhere from like the border of Chiang Mai to the border of Burma okay. so it is like in that sense if you're looking for big factories and if you're looking for you know lower operating costs then yeah you will go outside the major cities mm. yeah and that's that's what I was imagining as well is that you're having having to go to these places that yeah. are much more rural but because my quantities are not that big, yep. a lot of my stuff is done sort of in the smaller sampling rooms even or the smaller factories. Um, so it's, 
Yeah, but I mean, it depends. If, if the quantities are big enough, then they, they can send it to the bigger, bigger factory. So if someone's looking to start um, a similar type of business as yourself in terms of this uh, luxury uh, pajama wear and, and at-home wear, um, would you recommend that they, well, even start this business? <laughs> Number one. No, don't do it. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> or would, would you recommend that they, they start in China? Would they start in Thailand? What is the best direction that someone should go in to start to starting this type of uh, business? Well, f- first of all, just be clear on your intention. Like, what is it? Do you want to do this to make money? Or do you want to do this because you're passionate about the place you are and what inspires you? So... My intention was, I, of course, I wanted to be a sustainable business model, but my priority is not necessarily profit. My priority was trying to find a creative outlet that enabled me to collaborate with fellow female artists and to kind of pay respects to Thailand. So for me, it was important that it was manufactured in Thailand um, because, again, I think it's a social responsibility. Like if I manufacture it in Thailand and I live here, you know, all the money that I'm spending on the goods remains in Thailand. And if I'm hiring Thai designers and, and so forth. So for me, it was a social mm-hmm. responsibility. Um, and for sure, it's not an it's not a quick fix money making machine. You know, there's a lot of time and energy into building the brand, into creating the product and to creating the ideas behind it. And what, what went into your initial concept of building your brand? Because like anyone, when you're starting to build a brand, it's it can be a bit blurry at the beginning of, oh, what is my, like, what, what am I as a brand? And it takes, there's For a sure. lot of trial and error. There is. How, how did you start and where did you end up? Right. I started, this was pre-pandemic where I was just, I had this like inspiration to just do something creative. And actually I was flying to Hong Kong to I also work on a yoga brand. So I was w- flying there to visit factories. And on the flight there, I was just thinking, why aren't there any, you know, cool pajama brands? I was just thinking about pajamas for some reason. I was like, I've not seen any that are really made in Thailand. And, you know, I really love pajamas because I love being at home. And why mm-hmm. aren't they there? So that was, I guess it was identifying what I thought was missing in the market. Because everyone's like, oh, you should do swimwear or, oh, you should do beachwear. And I was like, there's so many people doing that. And it's kind of, Mm -hmm. I don't feel like it's. It's a bit overplayed as well. Yeah. And for me, I I didn't have any desire to do that. I was like, that doesn't interest me at all. So for some reason, loungewear and pajamas had always been something that I enjoyed buying and giving as gifts. But I never quite found the ones that I really loved. Mm -hmm. And then I just had the idea. I'm like, oh, I should make pajamas. <laughs> well, especially in Thailand in terms of the quality of um, fabric as well um, and, and finding that that quality. Like, for example, uh, with a, a previous girlfriend, we went hunting for high-quality bed sheets. Yeah. It's impossible. Yeah. Like in Phuket. I don't know about maybe in Bangkok, but I know in Phuket, absolutely. Like, it's always this, like, super you know, low-thread, itchy stuff. Um, so when you were sourcing that out in Thailand – to let everyone know that quality, it it's here. You just got to look for it. But I also had to develop my own fabric. Mm. So I actually did not find what I wanted. I actually had to like, you know, it, through trial and error and through working with the fabric mill, like weave the exact quality that I wanted. So that to me is also, that took like six months to like actually get it right. It's so not. So you're a, setting the standard yeah, for the so factory. I, there's a, you know, a really famous department store in London called Liberties and they have this beautiful like cotton. It's like butter. It's like silk. And obviously I'm not quite there yet, but Mm. you know, that was my benchmark. And I was like, I really want it to be really lightweight and really soft. And a lot of times people associate quality with thickness Mm -hmm. and it's actually the opposite. It's harder to make a beautiful quality, strong fabric that's really thin um, and like tightly woven. It's, it's actually more precise and it demands more time and it depends like it's just that to me it is the definition of luxuries like when you develop your own standard and your mm-hmm. own product and then again the same with the artworks like I didn't want to use prints that were generic or available like I specifically commissioned artists that I thought were cool or amazing or interesting for each collection that we do so that also it creates 
another level of ex- exclusivity mm-hmm. because nobody else has access to that artwork. So let, let's talk about that in terms of the influencers. Just give me one second. This machine's driving me nuts. Because usually we put it on one. You hear it clicking? Yeah. Yeah, yeah sorry. That's why I like, I'm losing focus. <laughs> click, you click. Hear it clicking though? Yeah. yeah. I wasn't sure if it was like a water pump. No, it never does. Usually we leave it on one. So it, what it's doing is it's scrolling. Oh. And then you're like, I just noticed it like five minutes ago and then it was just driving me nuts. For <laughs> one second. <laughs> are these like real mushrooms? Yeah, those are real. Mm. Let me just get some of these pictures. Yeah, because you can't have many on there. Let's just go uh, to Mario again. Maybe we'll keep you looking at the scene. Sorry, I messed up your name. You have, on my side, you have to understand, like, I don't rehearse. Yeah. And then I just have, like, so much information to just... Ch- no, yeah, all good. So like it, but it's uh, my brain just uh, gets fried. But I think we got that can skip, right? Yeah, yeah, you can keep it. That's how come good. it? How That's come it was doing it for so no long? Machine. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's your I machine, dude. It, did, I it, it, like it does that times. if you don't select it. It didn't select it before. Oh, okay, okay, we're back. So we'll, we'll jump back into how do we look on camera? Fabulous. <laughs> I'm ready for We'll jump back up. into. Um, the, the, let's we'll go into like uh, the marketing side now, and let's go into like the the social side in terms of like the artists you work for. Okay. Um, okay. Ready? Do we need to clap in? Clap. Okay, we're back. We had a technical difficulty with the arcade machine. It was clicking and driving me nuts, so <laughs> we had to fix that. Um, so we're gonna jump now into the marketing side of of your business. And as you were talking about working with these um, artist influencers. This strategy that you took on, I mean, it's is it unique in the, the design world of this type of business or are many companies applying this as well? And it's kind of a two-part question um, and it's more just the topic itself you can go off on. Um, what strategy did you use? Did you know the people you're reaching out to? Who were they and how did that all um, advance your business quickly? So, yeah, I just... Yeah, I know it's a long question. It's just a, okay, just, I'm just go to break it down. Okay, yeah, why? I think just go just direct, just more or less uh, talking about like the the whole s- the the artistic influence side and how that is helping to promote the business and just that whole process and concept of, as well, so people can understand really what that means. Right. So the concept behind collaborating with different artists for me was that I considered the fabric to be a blank canvas, and I wanted to invite different artists to collaborate with, and my you know, initial mindset was I want to work with female artists because that was just what I felt like was right at the time. And I still do. So the first artist that I worked with was a friend of mine and she's an oil painter. So I gave her the brief and then I wanted to do, you know, banana palms, monkey Mm -hmm. bananas, like banana blossoms. And then she beautifully oil painted everything. And I still have those paintings and they're also beautiful. So for me, it's, it's like building my art library as well. So I get to expand on that and also collaborate with them and allow them a space that they wouldn't necessarily be in. Like, I don't think that a lot of these artists, some are, but most of them are not into textiles. So it was allowing them to just have a different experience and do something fun. So, And is that easy to transfer? Like once they do that design and you bring that design to your factory, they're very, it's very easy to print, like in terms of the process itself, or are there limitations in design and color? Yeah, there's limitations to a certain extent. The techniques that we use are, we use a digital printer. So actually we have access to, you can use a multitude of colors and we're limited with size, I guess, like the repeat pattern I think is about 60 to 60. So there's some, depending on the machines and depending on the fabric roll width, you do have limitations, but with digital printing, it's amazing. Like you can literally, it's like a printer, like you're printing on fabric, which is great, which we, you might not have access to in India. Like India is still using block print or, you know, or the typical screen print process. So this is different. It's like, it's literally like a printer, which is amazing. 
So that's so you, really cool. So it's much easier because you're yeah. able to get it onto the canvas, which yeah. is the clothing quite, yeah. quite quickly as well. Yeah. Um, from that side of your first friend that was doing the oil paintings, where did that expand to? Were you involved with any other famous artists, like any Thai Bangkok artists? or? Yeah, female? so the second collection, I had been following an artist from Bangkok that I really loved her illustration. And actually, she's like, she's amazing. She's she's also got a huge following. Um, so I commissioned her to do the next print. And I also love vintage, and she also is really into vintage. So I wanted to do like a like a toile. So in France or in England, you'd have these toiles de jouy and it's like famous for like wallpaper. So it's like a two color. It's usually like pastoral scenes of like people in the, in the fields and whatnot. So you have it in France and in England. And I wanted to do a version of that, but with Thai elements. So, you know, elephants, tigers, floating markets, um, palm trees, like Thai architecture. So that was the second collection. And she like hand drew each thing. So there was about, I don't know, 12 or 15 different scenes. And we created also a pattern with that. Um, and the, the cool thing about her, too, is that she has her own following on Instagram and she has her own sort of fan base. So in a way, it's strategic to cross pollinate. So I get to expand my mm -hmm. audience and leverage as and, well. and leverage because I get to work with these artists. And so. I'm not the only person in fashion that's doing this. I think it's a very current thing. A lot of people collaborate with other mm -hmm. guest artists, I guess you want to call it. So, and for me, it, it just enables me to reach out to people I respect and I admire and get to collaborate with them. And I think it makes the brand more exciting and more f interesting. Do, do you do any, uh, I, I've noticed like uh, a lot of YouTubers are doing it now um, where they're doing merch, uh, but clothing and strictly clothing, but um, they do a lot of merch drops mm -hmm. and it's kind of that, uh, it creates that exclusivity. Um, it's time sensitive. We're doing a merch drop this month, but it's only this collection. And once that's gone, it's gone. Have you taken that into consideration or have you done any things like that? Um, well, I guess because I'm kind of a niche brand, like I don't get to make huge quantities. So everything is quite mm -hmm. limited in that sense. So I'm not I'm not saying there's no urgency for me. Like I don't want to push like, again, I find that a bit fast fashion. Like I don't want to push people to buy with that sense of urgency. I want people to buy in a slower way. Like I want them to feel the product or being given as a gift. Um, yeah. I think it's, I'm kind of anti drop anti, you know, like mm -hmm. I think it's, I want to go back to the ways where it's not about, scarcity or limitation it's just about do you love it is it going to make you happy then buy it like because if and that's how I approach my life I don't buy things because oh my god I need to have it like do I really love it do I want it and everything we own takes up space and energy in our lives so you have to be selective and again I'm like buy less but buy what you love you know I actually think I think it was Vivian Westwood buy less uh choose well make it last mm -hmm. and that's to me like the perfect way to live like just stop buying crap you know how else do you do you apply that uh thought process to, to your daily life well with everything like even with how we live and you know I'm, I'm pretty good with like you know I mean Thailand's not great with recycling but I mean I try to limit what we use in that sense I you know try to buy vegetables from my friend's farm we have solar power like as much as possible I want to leave less and less uh, harm on the mm -hmm. planet and and being I'm not saying I don't buy things and I'm not saying I don't you know occasionally buy fast fashion or high street fashion like I do and also I have a daughter and it's impossible not to you know buy some things but also if you're done with it like give it to charity or like mm -hmm. make use of its life cycle like you don't it doesn't have to be like thrown away like we can repurpose it or whatever so I I mean, I try to. Obviously, I'm not perfect, but as much as we can, we try to. Yeah, these shirts apparently are recycled material. Yeah, that's cool. But I'm not sure. It's from Mango. I don't know. I, it I'm, looks I'm, like I'm linen, like a blend. It is. It's linen, but I think it, no, it's a, uh, so it's 100% linen that's recycled. I don't know, whatever that's that means. That's cool. But uh, I buy, uh, once I go into a store and I see one shirt, I just buy 10 colors and I'm That's done. a very male thing. Yes. I have like two types of shirts and they're all like 10 colors well i'm a bit the same like i have a uniform like so yeah i mean when i'm in thailand obviously it's like 
loungewear or pajamas, but it's usually like white shirt or jeans if I'm abroad in it. I've actually had the same uniform <laughs> in like variations, but I'm I'm a white shirt, you know, jeans or trousers kind of person. Like, but then you're branding yourself as well, so that that's kind of how me. I looked at yeah. it. Yeah, I'm like, if I wear these shirts and they're all different ones, then like I become like uh, a more established brand or more recognizable when I'm Maybe. out. That was my idea behind it. I don't know if it's going to work, but let's see. Well, it's good to be yeah. consistent and it's good mm. to know. So I see it as like whatever you feel comfortable in is what you're going to look good in. So you Well, have in to Thailand, know. you need st- it needs to be light. Yes. I mean, because it's so bloody hot here. Yeah. I have a bunch of cotton shirts and like I'll put these on any day before yeah. a cotton t-shirt. It's yeah. just the, the those tighter cotton t-shirts, yeah. they, they just don't breathe that so well. So for me too, it just has to be slightly loose. Like I don't like tight clothes, especially in Thailand. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I chose cotton versus silk. So a lot of luxury brands use silk, but for me, silk equals like sweaty and disaster. <laughs> it just doesn't breathe well. Yeah. And for me personally, I just feel like it's, and it's also like harder to clean and, and like, I don't have time for a dry clean. And I just want to like put in the machine and like hang to dry and then I'm ready to go. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, it's less, less fuss. It's better for the environment. And yeah, I'm just, it's, it's more, it goes better with the lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Let, let's jump into the probably, I'm going to assume the aspect of the business you did not have experience with, meaning the online digital world in terms yeah. of the website. Um, as you made that transition to that site, and I'm, I, I, I did some, I'm assuming it's WordPress, WooCommerce, I'm guessing. Yep. Um, as you went to develop that, what steps did you take? Did you have to reach out to a digital company? Did you decide to take it on on your own? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people similar to like yourself. They can handle pretty much everything, but like anyone with a website, it can be complicated. Yeah, so do what you do best and hire the rest. (laughs) So (laughs) I am very good with product and design and I guess marketing and things, but when it comes to coding and building a website, I was like in over my head. So I knew right away, I was like, okay, I'm going to outsource this. And it was worth every penny because, and yeah, so the main frame of it is built. And then as I need updates, I just like, you know, use the same person and then just ask them to do it. Um, it's not something I particularly wanted to do. And I knew that it was necessary. So I decided to outsource that. And in terms of the retail side and, and the life cycle of the company itself, did you initially just go online? Did this all happen during the current situation so we don't get banned on YouTube? <laughs> um, current situation. <laughs> current situ- I don't know. I don't want to, any keywords, they pick it up and they just, they yeah. uh, demonetize you or whatever. Um, and now you, you are in retail stores in Phuket as well. So can you explain how, how that worked if you went digitally and then you went to the retail stores or could it, did it kind of happen simultaneously? I, I instinctively wanted to happen simultaneously so I believe that it's 2021 at the time it was 2020 and I was like okay everything and uh, there was like lockdowns after lockdown so for sure you have to be online to access your customer it's just standard now but again because I'm maybe old school or whatever I I still think that there is so much power in the tactical shopping experience so I I knew that I needed a retail partner so a friend of mine who has a shop here um was kind enough to allow me to launch it there and it did really well and then she continues to launch to carry the brand and, and this this is in boat avenue yeah so this is wings in boat avenue wings and boat don't yeah. this isn't some sort of sponsorship no, we're it's actually not. I'm we're just, actually I'm actually just... questions wings and boat avenue that's yeah. kind of is that across from it's across the... from the mexican yes, yes that's what i was gonna say yeah so she is a lovely Phuketian. she's danish um so she carries other brands as well um, and it was just the right fit. It was the mm-hmm. right customer, um, the right level of, I guess, luxury. Um, so yeah. And then we have a few other hotels that carry the brand and we have a retail, um, location in Bangkok as well. Yeah. So when I reached out to you, I saw you're, you're in Bangkok at one of the shopping malls and is that, were you just starting this connection or is this no. something relatively new? So last year we started selling to a department store in Bangkok and then, I guess this time of year, it's like there's all these markets or sort of bazaars happening. So we tend to, you know, you set up, it's like a market. You set up a booth and you you hustle, you're selling your goods, you're selling your wares. But actually, it's really fun because you get to connect with other female entrepreneurs and their brands. And Bangkok is, 
you know, a different market than Phuket. So you get to see the difference in the customer behavior and how they buy, what they buy. Um, so yeah, it's, it's great. I think it's just, it's been, it's been, you know, it's been good to mm. slowly expand. And again, I'm not in a hurry to, I don't necessarily think it should be in every single shop. Like I think it's, it's nice that you have people that you align with and that you create relationships with. Do you, do you have a like a five year plan for the business as well? Do you plan to bring it back to Canada, or do you, being able to put that online and shipping from Thailand to the U.S. or well, Canada? We ship internationally, yep. so that's always been the idea. Is that or or let's say Amazon, or do you plan to expand expand I there? I saw you were, you were on. I think I saw you were on Shopee. No. I thought I because when I pulled oh. up when I typed it in, something popped up. That could be someone reselling it. To be honest. <laughs> Well, Um, I think we were looking into the idea of having our own shops through these channels, because again, in Thailand, you know, Shopee or Lazada, it's, it's just how people buy. It's like a pattern, right? So I think we're kind of looking into it, but right now we're just doing direct sales, um, through our website or through line, the app again, like Thai people like the immediate response and the one-to-one with line. So line is it's almost like you don't even need a website sometimes in Thailand. It, it's mainly for international customers. Um, I think with Thai customers, it's really direct. And they're able to contact you. Yeah. M- making it much easier. Yeah. Um, have you seen any copies on the market? Because this can happen in fashion, and I know that this definitely happens in the toy industry, where your print, you're not exclusive at that factory, and if a competitor comes along and they try to grab it, next thing you know, it's in Chiang Mai, it's in Bazaar. <laughs> Well, so far, so good. So, so far, no. But then again, it's it's about having good relationships with my factory. And I am I have a clause where it's I they're not allowed to use whatever, even if there's like a sliver of fabric left over, like I, I, I won't allow anyone else to have access to it. There's intellectual property. You know, I, you know, I spend money on a trademark. There's all these things that I need to protect it. I mean, for sure, it'll happen eventually. But for now, I mean... Also, we're such a small niche business. I think if people were really like greedy, they wouldn't they wouldn't necessarily go down the route that I'm going down. Mm-hmm. Um, on a side note, because of the current situation and and you uh, your your business is in pajamas and at home wear, well, that really connected perfectly together. Yeah, it was um, weird. <laughs> so with that timing ha- happening, did you notice was there an explosion in your business just because more people are staying at home? And I mean. If for someone like myself, if I'm at home, I'm like, I'm not wearing this. I'm wearing basketball shorts and yeah. that's about it. Yeah. I mean, it was kind of, it did not hurt to that people had to stay home. So I did get a lot of people saying, oh, thank you for making my lockdown so much more glamorous. And mm. Or people like living in the UK that would order and they were like, I feel like I'm on a mini holiday in my tropical pajamas. And I kind of, in a way I felt like, these pajamas are like postcards for people that come to visit Thailand. So that was also a part of why I wanted to do them. Um, and it's, it is, it's, it's a great way to feel happy at home and Mm -hmm. um, be comfortable and be reminded of your holidays or be reminded of a place that you love. So for me, it's, it's not so much, I mean, you're selling what the product will make you feel, not necessarily just the products. So you have to, that's why creating a brand and creating a story is so vital because people don't just buy products. They buy the ideas behind them or the memories or the inspirations or whatever values that are inherent to it. So they need to connect to the product. Yeah, I think so. And I, as do I, like I don't want to do something just for the sake of doing it. So for me, this is a passion project. Like these are things that I believe in. So these are like, even in our, in, in the narrative, in our branding, it's all things that I think are important. Like, you know, investing in rest, being at home, um, you know, having a sacred space or having these rituals of rest. Mm -hmm. So I'm really fascinated by, because we live in such an extroverted society, like everything's so geared towards doing and achieving and showing, showing and being out there. And there's nothing wrong with that, but I'm just so curious. Why don't we focus on the, the other side of it? Like I, I guess I am an introvert. I like being at home. I feel like I create a sanctuary at home. And <laughs> mm-hmm. I was joking with my husband. I like I spend more money on scented candles and pajamas and bed sheets than I would on like going out clothes. Because for me, being at home is my sanctuary. Well, you're you're comfortable there as well. And yeah. I, I'm I'm an introvert extrovert meaning like ambivert. 
I don't know. The second, like, if I just don't want to talk to I could just turn off for two yeah. weeks. Yeah. And I'm gone, and then I'll come out of the woodworks. <laughs> <laughs> you pop your head out. Like, yeah. Oh. yeah, maybe I'm ready ready for it now. But um, I was reading that about an, an article that you were in as well, that um, the top kind of five things that, that you put on your list, and one being sleep. And that d- definitely connects to, to your at-home wear as well. Why is sleep so important for you? I don't know. I think sleep is a regenerative process and I think it's I don't know I've always enjoyed I've always enjoyed sleep I'm not one of those people that thinks it's wasted time like I actually and I I really like dreams I'm really into like subconscious and I really love everything like the science behind the sleep too I find mm-hmm. really fascinating so and I think people are catching up and how vital sleep is so it's like if you don't sleep, it's just as bad as not do you, hydrating. Do you track it at all? Like, I, I have this little app, and this tracks my sleep. And if today I woke up a bit groggy, mm. and I didn't really know why, and then I go and check the app, and it's like I had zero deep sleep last night. It's because you didn't have your Siamese Dreams pajamas. I think that's what happened. So Spe- now, uh, Speaking of which, <laughs> I okay. happen to have a little yes. gift for okay, you. Okay, so we have a gift here. So this is... Um, How are we on time anyway? Because sometimes these... Oh, okay. Okay. We're okay. We're good. So... Th- I oh, realized, wow. I didn't realize it was your birthday, but happy birthday and Merry Christmas. <laughs> Perfect timing. Let's do a, what is this? An, a, a, an, a, an YouTube un, a YouTube unboxing? Yeah, let's do Aye. it. Okay. So another thing that I think is important is packaging and, mm. you know, Make sure the experience right. of what it should be. Okay. And we have a, a card here. Um, <laughs> happy holidays. Ooh, thank you. Thank you very much, Mika. You're now very let's, welcome. let's, uh. Put this over here for now. Let's unpackage this. I'll wear these on the next. I should have just wore these on this podcast. <laughs> we should have. <laughs> next time, let's do a pajama party. Yeah, there we go. I don't want to. Ain't do no rip? party like a pajama party. <laughs> oh wow. Okay, so we got. Let's see if the. Yeah, that should fit me. So I gave you a medium, but if you want to size up, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, let's see how fat I am. Um, no, I'm okay. I'm in shape now. I, I was pretty chubby three months ago. Well, I think everyone was. In like yeah, I was like, all right, that, that's about enough. No, I've just <laughs> been eating salads every day. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think that should fit. And do we, do we show this on the TV? Sure. How do we do so this? So this is here? our like short sleeve. Okay, let's explain that. Hawaiian yeah. shirt. I took a vintage um, shirt from my husband and I kind of deconstructed it. And then I used that as the pattern. So it's like a cool Hawaiian vibe, song crown shirt, but like obviously you can wear it as pajamas. But actually, you could wear it out if you yeah, want. Yeah, yeah. Do, can people wear this out as yeah, well? Yeah, you can it's for pretty, sure. It's pretty dope. So it's all how you style and it. There's a uh, shorts. No, these are long trousers. Oh, long trousers. So these are your like at home. And you can oh, wear. We'll oh, and I got you a face mask. And a face mask. Okay. So long. these are long trousers. They have pockets, elastic waist, drawstring. Um, these are great for just being at home in like with a t-shirt or with your matching shirt yeah because usually i'm just on my couch again in basketball pajamas and yeah the but now you'll have a little done. more yeah, of a luxury look beautiful look at that <laughs> and i can smell like is there like a scented candle there, like there like is a, a secret scent that i've developed yeah. that i spray all of our orders with Oy. and our packaging and it's kind of like a, a final step. i'm terrible at folding so let's <laughs> deal with that and we got a mask here yeah awesome. because you know it's thailand and if you want to get into 7-eleven you got to wear your mask so let's see that there, there we go. go. Uh, I can't put that around. Awesome. Thank you so much. Let's You're put welcome. that. Where can I put that? One sec. Is this the first gift you've received on your podcast? No, I've received. What other gifts did I receive? Do you remember? Someone gave me a bunch of uh, Kratom juice once. Oh, okay. That's fun. <laughs> that, some guy. De- oh, this guy. Oh, K, K Energy. Thank you. They delivered some Kratom juice. For sure, I've got another gift. I've done like, this is the th- Actually, well, this congratulations, number 30. Oh. This is uh, podcast number 30. Nice. Um, oh, no, last week, was it? No, we took last week off. We needed a bit of, I needed a break. So we've been doing like one a week and sometimes two a week. Uh, last week, uh, Holly Aloha, she's just like online Ukrainian poker player, came on and she gave us some cake. Yeah, what cake was that? and cake and, and, cake juice. and like a type of cranberry juice. I think it's from oh. that Russian place in okay, cool. Porto. Okay, cool. That oh, was delicious though. Nice. Oh, yeah. It's always nice. Oh, we're getting presents now. We're I guess well, we're on know, the map. You always <laughs> no. I don't know. You should always give your host a gift, I think. I, I give gifts later, but we can't talk about that on the air. <laughs> <end. laughs> 
Anyways, we're trying to be easy on the, the Thai side. I don't want to get in too much trouble. But um, um, uh, back to your side. Let's talk a little bit about Thailand itself. And you're between the UK and Kamala, and then you've started this this business. Um, why Kamala? How, how did you end up settling here and deciding that this is how you're going to sp- kind of spend the rest of your life, essentially, going back and forth between uh, Phuket and the UK? Well, it just goes back to when I used to come to Bangkok and my boss had a home in Kamala. So that was just the first experience in Phuket. And I just, it's one of those things. If you, if you, I don't know, if you fly into New York and, and then you're in the Upper East Side, you're just going to gravitate to wherever you flew in first. So for me, it was my first sort of reference of Phuket. And I just always loved it. I loved the, just the, the, the lifestyle, the scenery. I like Kamala because you have the beach, but you also have the mountains. So you have this like little valley mm-hmm. and there's still like a Thai community. Um, like now it's more developed over the years. Like you have more resorts and more more restaurants and things but it still has this charm that i really like what do you find about the water because for me personally it's a bit mucky it depends it depends where you are because i'll be surfing there down by the intercontinental but there's a lot of people they don't there's pipes there or it's coming because you know how it goes back into the the village yeah the village is right and like i've been in that i don't know i'm sure you've seen it as well sometimes in camelab down by the intercontinental you're surfing and like you're literally surfing in garbage bags I find it's just unfortunate, and I feel like it's yeah. almost everywhere in Phuket, which is really sad. Um, but yeah, it's not, I mean, we need to do better, for sure. So, you know, we we do the beach cleanups, but I think it's it's bigger than that. So, again, so I, you know, I don't want to use plastic in my products and mm-hmm. try not to, yeah, try not to create more harm. So, yeah. What is it specifically about, because it's easy to discuss Thailand and why you would love Thailand, but specifically, what is it? more more or less just about Phuket is it the beaches is it the vibe is it the laid back style yeah it's all those things but it's also we needed somewhere that had enough international schools access to a hospital access to an international airport so if we're staying here as a base and like raising a family we need those we need those pillars you know you need like a we can't we probably couldn't do this if we were living in a smaller lo- island i mean it's probably more beautiful and remote but we need access to those um yeah to those things mm-hmm. so phuket offered that plus beaches plus you know a, a lifestyle so for us it works um it's not too far off the beaten path either. yeah and it's it's actually it's funny because everyone's like oh you're so lucky you live in phuket it must be so relaxing and i'm like actually it's not sometimes there's traffic sometimes it's busy you know in high season um you know if you live here or your kids go to school you still have to you have these daily responsibilities it's not like we're just sitting on the beach all day like we're actually doing things so it's weird it's great as a base here and it's probably not the best thing to say but i think phuket's better to live than it is to visit mm-hmm. if you know what i mean yeah so i if i was a tourist i probably if i really want to experience thailand i'd probably go like i don't know like Kolipe or Koh Samet or Atlanta or yeah. like there's these really gorgeous islands that represent thailand off the beaten track or mm. or even chiang mai or chiang rai or it's a different experience of thailand so for me phuket is in a way, more international. Like it's kind of like I see it as like a an Ibiza or a South of France, or mm-hmm. it's it's has like a tropical but still metropolitan energy about it. Yeah, and I mean I've been in Asia eleven years or, or whatnot, but there's really no other place in all of Southeast Asia that compares to Phuket. And no. it's not being biased. I mean, just yeah, maybe bali but it's so bali's so far away from here it's far away and there's like literally two roads and there's always traffic there's so (laughs) much traffic i've been to bali five times and every time i go i'll do it like every three years Um, and the second i get out of the airport i go why the hell did i come here yeah because it's it's good to be reminded as you come back unless you kind of like stay in your bubble in bali like if you're at changu and you just don't leave or if you live in ubud and you just don't leave and it's beautiful and yeah yeah, i'm down with that but i don't think i would want to live there and i think it's too hard to access so phuket for us and the way that we are in our lifestyle and yeah, my husband needs to travel so we need we need the flights we need the access we need the school 
Um, so for us, it ticks all those boxes. But for sure, I there's like other parts of Thailand that I love to visit. And where, where else have beautiful. you have you been all around Thailand, or most do you have of, like a favorite most, spot, or is it kind of hard to pin that? I mean, down? there's so many amazing spots, but I really love Riley Beach in yep. Krabi. Um, it's really beautiful, and Krabi Province. It's the limestone cliffs. You know, they're just so dramatic and so beautiful. Mm-hmm. Um, so I really like Krabi province. Pang Na is also really beautiful. So I, I, yeah, I do like the Southern, like I like, for me, I like mountains and I like the ocean. So I think I would get a little bored of just a little island of sand. Like I like, and maybe even Bali too. Like I, I find like there's not enough trees on the beaches. There's not enough like foliage. There's not enough And the sand's that kind of volcanic. Yeah, it's cool and all, but I don't know. There's something lush about Phuket. It's like so vibrant and green and alive. And that's like, for me, Southern Thailand represents that. But also the fact that Phuket's quite uh, nationalistic in in, in the sense that... um, they don't they don't build up into the mountains and they allow that to stay lush. I mean, yeah, you have Surin over here and there's some uh, larger villas up in the mountains, but generally like if you if you have a view of the mountains, they haven't built up in those. And I think that's that's interesting not yet. which not <laughs> yet. Yeah. I I don't know if they will. I think also maybe they can have issues with like landslides. No, for sure. There is there is some protected things and yeah, there's just technically you can't really build up <clears> high <throat> into the mountains, so and yeah, it's just really beautiful. And I, I really enjoy that, those mountain views, I have to say. Like in the beginning, I used to be like obsessed with the beach. But now I'm like, oh, I really like the mountains. Well, and it's nice this time of year because yes. it's, it's a bit cold. Because yeah. by summertime, it gets a bit snaky and a bit hot. <laughs> so Yeah, it gets um, a little sticky. Y- you do some, um, um, I know you can go from one of the dams and go all the way to Kamala. It's like yeah, a four-hour so hike. You could. It's probably like a three-hour hike at a good mm. pace. So we could start in Kamala, and then you can go all the way up through Manique and come out at the dam on the other side. Where do you enter in Kamala? There's a few places, but there's one. It's kind of like like if you not go far from the Kamala lookout point. Do you know where that is on the main road? As you look into the bay of Kamala, there's like a lookout point. Do you? It's have to like, like kind of Lamsing ish okay there's like a little white uh, lookout point on the side of the road yes so it's there's a few entrances oh there's a little that little down. there's that little trail there and sometimes they sell stuff right there this sometimes. lady sells beans or something sometimes oh, but okay. yeah so my husband usually goes he's like a hikeaholic he mm. hikes like two three times a week so he usually enters that spot and he'll go up there's like a a lake up there yeah and he'll like float and meditate and then he'll come back down but sometimes he'll do the one where you go over to Monique or there's another one where you can walk all the way to like Patong, like to the Kalim viewpoint. So there's but a you few have to d- enter at the Kalim. Yeah. yeah. So there's a few different routes to take, but it's really amazing to be in the dense jungle. Like it's so beautiful. But you see, I've I've tried to go, but it's hard to get people to go, and I wouldn't want to do it on my own because yeah. you don't want something bad to happen. For in the sure, jungle. I would definitely recommend going oh. with someone. <laughs> yeah. But um, once you know the paths, I'm I think it's okay. But yeah, if you're if you're just starting out, but yeah, you can ask my husband. He's going up like two, three times a week. Yeah, I've I've I used to go with well with an ex girlfriend. We would go from the dam. Um, she did some sort of run from that dam all the way to Camilla. It's like fifteen wow. k. Yeah, she's a lunatic. I'm like, there's not a chance. I'm doing <laughs> that. But we would just go up to the top of the the mountain yeah. there. Yeah, it's really beautiful. Yeah, and it's nice once, especially this time of year. Once yes. once you're in there, uh, it's a bit cooler. Um, it's a bit safer as well. I, I find like definitely the snakes aren't out now, but I mean, by June, July, like when I go in the, the fields here, like I've been attacked by like three, uh, three cobras. Before. Oh my God. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's traumatizing. Yeah. I mean, right. Yeah, you're right. This time of year is quite safe. And in a way, if you, if you're loud enough and you stomp enough, they're usually yeah. scared of you, but yeah, better safe than sorry for sure. I wanted to jump into a, a side subject in, in terms of the art side and um and maybe a business opportunity that you're thinking of pursuing as well with the new emerging trend of nfts are you going to take this into consideration into the the, art, the the clothing brand meaning when you release items you might do an nft to kind of match that that could not only just be digital but physical as well with the product i mean it's interesting i think nfts and they're really something to watch and that's something that i find fascinating I don't think I would connect it to my particular clothing brand, but some of the artists that I, like this, one of the artists that I collaborated with for our prints, she's doing NFTs now. So it is happening. And my husband's doing NFTs. Mm-hmm. So it's it's around me. 
and I find it interesting, but I don't know. I feel like this is my sacred little project and I'm not sure yet, but I don't know. I'm open to the idea of it, but right now I think it's not necessarily attached to this project, but it's something yeah, that we're working that. off in, in other, in other ways. Yes. You have your focus and you, uh, uh, you don't want too much noise coming in from yeah. multiple directions as yeah. well. But yeah. I, but I, I do think it's fascinating. It's a fascinating, like the digital world and value and ownership and what does it mean and what does it mean to you? And so I, you know, and art is, it's a sign value. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's a, just an interesting change of how we interact and how we purchase things. Yeah. It's, it's something I, I got an eye on it. I've, I put a little, I did a little bit of investing, but more on like the crypto NFT sandbox stuff. Okay. You're purchasing digital tokens. Okay. I just thought, ah, oh, whatever, just buy a bunch and leave it there and see what happens. Yeah. Pro I think that's the, that's the key. You have to just do it without feeling a sense of loss. Like it's yeah. kind of like just do it and then do what you like and then just kind of sit on it and see what happens. So that's kind of the approach we're doing. We're a, taking. Yeah. That's a, what I'm thinking as well for that as well. Um, okay. Now let's jump into the, the psilocybin and magic mushroom <laughs> side while, while we, 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 um, gonna switch gears. Now. Yeah. Let's switch gears a little bit. What, so what are your thoughts of, um, of psilocybin just in general? And if you want to explain your experiences with it? Well, I think it's, you know, it's, it comes from nature. It's something of a plant medicine. So I do believe that, you know, people have been using this for centuries. It's like, we're no, there's nothing new here. We're just catching up, you know, science is catching up. And I think that there's so much research now that's going into healing and healing trauma and to even heal depression. And there's so, there's like so many things happening now. And I think it's, just amazing and it's it's wonderful and i think everyone should you know again be safe with your set and setting like mm -hmm. don't go crazy um it's not a party drug it's a it's a tool it's a tool to transform it's a tool to heal but again it's it's really important your set and your setting like and feeling safe and feeling yeah like and you should also do the work and it's like it's about setting intention and and what do you want to focus on? Have you used it as a tool for yourself in the yes, past? Yes, I have. And are you able to share? Because it is it is quite personal and intimate, so you don't want you don't need to expose everything. But no, but I think for me, growing up in Canada, and you know, you have a lot of spare time on your hands. Yeah. So you you as a growing up as a teenager, you spend a lot of time in the woods or whatever. So of course, you're going to find these magical friends, and you're going to explore. So. For me, I always thought it was a really f interesting way to reconnect. And for me, I always felt like it was these really cool spiritual awakenings. I always felt really connected. I always felt like, I was like, oh, I get it now. I can see that I'm a part of the the earth and the earth is part of me. And I saw everything on a cellular level. Like mm -hmm. I saw everything connecting and everything made sense. So for me, it brought me like an inner knowing. It brought me a sense of calming and i knew that in its magnitude how insignificant i was in this giant universe and how we're all just moving and we're all just divine expressions of life's longing for itself are, are you spiritual as well or do you follow a religion um i don't follow religions but i would consider myself very spiritual so growing up obviously my mom was buddhist my father was christian but i think i was like quite young when I started reading about Buddhism and Hinduism and, you know, reading about Ram Dass and like I was, and I still am like really interested with spiritual thought. So for me, spiritual thought is about, it's not a religion. It's just a philosophy. It's a way of life. It's thought patterns. It's accepting yourself. It's, um, yeah, it's just about truth seeking, I guess. Yeah. Cause I, I read you, you also practice kundalini yoga does yeah. that connect to the spirituality side as well i think it is so for me kundalini is my favorite type of yoga for various reasons one of them is what's cool about it is that, so you do some mantras you do some chanting um and a lot of the times your eyes are closed during your practice so it's you're actually not focusing on other people you're just kind of going within so kundalini for me really actually helped me materialize this creative project like sometimes i would just and also meditation. So I do TM. 
So TM helps me. So what is oh, TM? Oh, Transcendental Meditation. Can you explain that a bit? So trans- I, I, I honestly have no idea. So Transcendental Meditation is a meditation where you are given a mantra that's specific to you. Mm. You have to go through a lineage of teachers. Like the, you have to go through like a, I guess it's a crash course. It's like a few days and there's like some rituals and you are given a specific mantra and you repeat the mantra and you're supposed to, it's only 20 minutes, but by the time you get to this, you're repeating this mantra, you get to this place of complete stillness. So I find that mantra really helpful because I have, it's hard to train your monkey mind to just like Turn focus, the right? Chatter. Exactly. So as you repeat a, a mantra and you just focus on your breathing, it gets to a point where it's just really rhythmic and it's really soothing and I find I can really go deep and it's allowed me to like, I call them downloads. I just, whatever I'm seeking, I can achieve or I can access in or that you're place. You're tuned, tuned in. Yeah. So I'm tuned in and that place where I have experienced on psilocybin is the same place I can access when I do TM. Yeah. And that, that's, they say that the same kind of chemical reaction can happen yeah. as well um, from psilocybin and, and naturally as well from, from these types of meditations, but it's very difficult to get there. Yeah. Um, ha- have you heard of ak- Akashic readings? Yeah, I have. Akashi- ak- I always Akashic s- yeah, see, records. Ak- Akashic records, yes. yes. Have you done one of those meditations before? I did one once. It's about an hour. I can send you a link. Yes, yeah, I think it's amazing. I've um, not done that meditation, but I've had an Akashic records reading. Okay. So in regards to my past lives and yeah. things like that. So, yeah, I find it. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I'm open. I'm open to everything. Like, I'm really open to whatever tools are available. And at times, sometimes I'll lean into to, to yoga more, and sometimes I'll step out, and sometimes I'll be really into the uh, to the meditation, and then there's some weeks where I just, you know, I'm not, or I'm just, I'm not into it. Mm-hmm. So, but again, it's like a tool, and it's rhythmic. So sometimes I go into these cycles, and sometimes I move out. But I'm grateful that I have them in my toolbox, and that I can access them when I need to. But yeah, meditation, even if I don't do the the TM, you know, before I go to bed and before I wake up, I try to do like a, just a small gratitude meditation. And I find it just energetically just changes my physiology, if you know what I mean. Like I just, my body starts to relax. And the minute you start finding things that you're grateful for is the minute your body just releases any tension. Mm-hmm. So and this nice is a, pr- a practice asleep. you would do every yes, yeah, so just bed. to fall asleep, and then in that state of like when you're on the cusp of subconscious, you know, when you're not quite awake, but you're not yeah, quite sleeping. But it feels like you're asleep almost. That's it's, my favorite place. Yeah, it's that place. I've been there a few times on meditation, but it's a strange place in the sense that like once you come out of it, you start to wonder if you were asleep. Yeah, it's almost like a waking dream state. Yeah, it's very strange. But again, I've like for it, yeah. me, I'm like so into that. Like obviously, that's why I made pajamas. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's how we're all connecting this. Together. Exactly, it's all dreams. It's all subconscious. It's all mm. it's all connected for sure. Have you tried DMT ayahuasca before? I've done ayahuasca. Mm-hmm. Um, we did a ceremony. We did two ceremonies, and again, that was a a really beautiful. Did you transformative do it in Peru tour. or no? We did it. Um, in Samui. Okay. I did it in Copenhagen. Okay. But uh, yeah, it's, uh, did you have a good experience? Did you have a large group of people or was no, it more private? We were really fortunate that if we did it in a private setting and I actually is still in touch with the shaman. I think he's really a beautiful person. And again, I thought it was, it wasn't like, that's what people need to understand. It's not like just being like messed up. It's really, it's like a journey, you know, and you have to, it's again, set and setting. You have to be with some people that you feel safe with. You have to set an intention. You have to be clear as to why you're doing this and what do you feel like you need to be told or what messages you need. So yeah, my, I, you know, I was very clear about my intentions. And for the week before I was like trying to fast and trying to like, I was quite like serious about it. You know, I, I approached it with, reverence almost you know and i think people need to remember that it's like a sacred thing it's like a there is you know these these rituals they're sacred and they're beautiful and and it's about respect and reverence to you know mother nature and Mm -hmm. that she is the ultimate healer and knower of everything so when you meditate or when you're doing ayahuasca or even psilocybin you're reconnected to the source and that source is mother nature and she reminds us all of like why we're here and how we're all connected and you know 
it's it's really powerful and healing, but it's it's not for the faint of heart either. Yeah, I mean you you have to have some sort of understanding of about what, what you're getting into, yeah. and I, I think um, like I I don't know if I would tell anyone just to take ayahuasca. I've done ayahuasca anyway, so we said that, but meaning maybe start with a little bit of mushrooms and work yes. your way up to that. Yes, absolutely. Don't just jump into ayahuasca. No, it's um like figure feel feel what because I find even like psilocybin in a very low dosage, like half a gram, a gram, very low. Um, there's a certain feeling that you get. I don't know. It's almost euphoric, yeah. but nothing's hap happening. But that is kind of when it gets very intense in it ayahuasca. It can be really overwhelming. Very o overwhelming because it's it just it almost flushes through your entire body. Yeah. And if you're not used to that, you might you know freak out a little bit. No, absolutely. And there are moments where I did freak out, you know, and I had to. Go, I, I go I, I always go back to my mantra to you know and you have to have tools that can help you soothe yourself so yeah you know you have to have these you have to be prepared and for sure that's like you know baby steps for sure like yeah. so start off small and do the work and it's not going to be pretty you know mm -hmm. it's it's overwhelming it's scary um, there's a lot of purging involved yeah and but it's really at the same time, life-changing and i felt so much lighter after i felt i released a lot of like pain and trauma and and the next day it's you don't have like some sort of hangover no, like, like a synthetic drug would absolutely do absolutely not nothing and that's what i found so amazing because i didn't feel like even if i have one glass of wine i Same. feel it the next day yeah. and this i felt nothing i felt so clean a little bit tired yeah, because you've been through it. Because you, your, br your brain's yeah. been like <laughs> going at 7,000 RPM, yeah. But, but other than that, you're not like, you're not, you know, you don't want to, you know, put a bullet in your head like no, sometimes on, not, if, if you drink too much. Has, yeah. it, it's, it's absolutely not that experience at all. Like it's so internal Yeah. and it's so, yeah, it was, it's not for everyone, but I'm grateful that I got to experience it. And I think it also finds you. You know, I think if you're ready, like the universe will lay the path for you. Yeah. Um, and Affirmation, I guess. Yeah. And I think that, yeah, but it's definitely, and not everyone needs to do it. It's not for everyone. That's for sure. Have Have you been to Jungala in? Jungala? Yes. Jungala. And Jungala, they do the, the sound healing? Yeah. So actually we, we met with Wolf, I think his name is. Yeah. The German guy, right? Yeah. So yeah. we actually, my husband's really into the singing bowls and so am I, and, and we use it like during meditations and we went to buy one of these beautiful tibetan bowls that's like a silver full moon like crafted on the full moon in tibet like it's so beautiful so yeah we I mean we use it all the time actually just to you know meditate and just just like resonate like s somatically like the, the the vibrations again that takes me back to the source like i feel like ah oh, these are like the sounds that i hear when i go to that place you know, it's that it's that vibration of energy is that same level of when I meditate or it's like it's all that it's just energy and it's like purest form. Yeah, I I did it not. So what month with the current situation? I've lost track of time <laughs> and also living in Thailand because there's no seasons and you kind yeah. of forget. But I think I was there not this October, the one before. And I went in and, and did a Saturday morning session and they do it for free, which yeah. is crazy. And it's then, really but you just give them, you know, you yeah. donate. Yeah. Um, and they, uh, this was the first time I was learning all the mantras. I mean, everybody knows Om, but no one probably knows the others. Um, so I was kind of just learning on the fly yeah. as we're going, but you have to attach it to colors yeah. plus going around with the bowl. And when he came around with the bowl, I finally got into it. And when he, that bowl came up to you and you don't know it's about to hit you, it was like a drug. It is. Like I felt this like wave that like I actually woke up. It's it like a that. sonic wave. Yeah. It's like somatic energy. It's so it's it's sonic healing. Like it's it's crazy. Sometimes I'll do these singing bowls and then the first time one of the first times I did it, the next day I couldn't get out of bed. I was so like I felt like years of pain or whatever. Like mm. I just it was such a moving experience. Like sometimes it's gonna unlock things that you didn't even know you were feeling. So it's a powerful, that too is such a powerful tool. Like, Is it a massage for the nervous system? I think it is. Like, I think it is. Because sometimes I just like, it's so soothing to me. Mm -hmm. And I just, yeah, your whole body feels completely different after. Like it realigns you. It releases stored tension. So it's like, 
it's it's amazing. So yeah. Have you done it in the water before? No, I've not done it in the water. That See, might be the, cool. Actually, I did it um, when I was in Taiwan. These old older ladies, like we call them grannies, right in Taiwan, and like we had like kind of a a swimming pool where everybody would, I don't know, I was like 23, would go party and this and that. But then the people would be partying, but these grannies still use the pool, pool on like this other side. <laughs> and they were just doing the bowls and you'd go over there and you could feel, feel the vibration. It, yeah, under the water That's because cool. it's coming right yeah, through. It's, it's like very ripples. interesting. Yeah. Hmm, very did you crazy. try that? Yeah. Give it okay. a go. It was, uh, but also you kind of, I think you need the, the higher quality singing bowls. You can't just, I'm assuming you probably can't just find it at some souvenir shop here. No, I think you need the, the legit ones. Yeah. And so Jingla has the legit ones. Yeah. Yeah. I think, it, I think maybe the only place in Phuket has the, the legit ones. Yeah. And it's, it's, I, I keep meaning to go, but it's one of those things when you get stuck uh, in your bubbles here. Yeah. No, Rawai is far. You need your passport. Like when yeah. you live on this side of the island. Yeah. I find, do you find that living in Phuket, you kind of get stuck in your district? Yes. A hundred percent. Why do you think that is? I don't know. Um, Phuket's a big island. People forget how big it is. People think, oh, it's just an island, right? But no, it's actually a big island. So if you want to, you have to decide what area you're going to be in. And uh, again, like where you live, where your kid goes to school, where you work, it's like we try to keep it in the same sort of 25 minute radius. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, but I mean, there's so many cool stuff down south. Like all my, whenever I say I'm going down south, it's like, okay, I'm going to do my hippie shit now. Like I'm going yeah. to do my, my singing bowls. I'm going to get some vegan food. I'm going to do some kundalini yoga. And, you know, I'm doing all those things down there. Cause I guess the crowd is younger. It's a little more Copanyan kind of vibes. Whereas in Kamala, I'm not going to lie. Everyone's like retired, you know? Yeah. So, but it's fine. Like we're super happy there. So it's, you know, it's the right energy for us. Like we're not here to party. We're just here to like to live our lives and to just, you know, get on with things. And now with the high season arriving, no rain. Yeah. It's looking gorgeous it's now. So gorgeous. And the sunsets have I been amazing. It's up, so yeah. fire. Yeah. yeah. Well, on that note, because you need to pick, pick up, up my your daughter. From your, school. your daughter. Um, <laughs> we will wrap this up. Uh Okay. Um, so what what we'll do is uh, this is your camera. We'll cut to you. And if you can just kind of tell the listeners, all seven of them right now. <laughs> um, no, no, I think we're starting to grow a little bit. It's coming. Um, it's just like, you can tell the listeners like more or less like where to find you in terms of like uh, website and Instagram. And um, yeah, take it from there. Shameless self-plugging. Yeah, shameless self-plugging. Yeah. Right. So you can find us online. It's SiamesDreams.com. And on Instagram and Facebook, it's Siamese Dreams Official. And then you can also find us on the Line app, which is Siamese Dreams. In Phuket, you can find us at Wings in Boat Avenue. And yeah, that's pretty much it. I mean, yeah, come and have a look, have a follow, get into some PJs. And are, are you still, sorry, just to jump in on that, are you doing any consulting still as well? Or is that kind of, you're just really focused on what you're I doing? I do a little bit. I mean, like I said, we have a yoga brand as well. So I work with that. Um, and what is your yoga brand? It's called Yo Gangster. Oh, and this is that, I'm talking to one of the, is it Lynn from Somali? Sum, Sum, oh, Somali? Lynn, yeah, she's from Somali Boxing. So. I'm talking to her because she's got a book coming out. So yeah, my friend great. Callum connected me to her and he, I, I, I totally missed the call. I got to No, you should, you should speak to her. I'm, I have yeah. a lot of respect for her. I finished reading her book, actually. So I'm friends with her and I'm friends with her daughter, Rianne. So Rianne is also a yoga teacher and a full, like, full credentials Thai interpreter mm. like she is she can do like UN level interpretation oh wow she's back in the UK now but I think she's she just landed in Bangkok she's going to come visit for a couple of weeks yeah. So yeah they're really cool people and again just women who are kicking ass here in Thailand and just being awesome and you know her book was really cool I really enjoyed it yeah. what, what was it about so it's about her opening a Muay Thai business in okay. Thailand being a woman and also, yeah, it's, it's it's a trip, like, for sure. Yeah, that's what my friend recommended her to me. He said, you should reach out to this lady. He's also friends with his daughter, or her yep. daughter. And, um, yeah, I, I'll probably give her a call after this podcast. I was supposed to on Sunday, but you know how it's weekend? Sure. I'm terrible on weekends. I can drop off her book if you like. I've just finished it. So yeah, maybe you great. should read it before you interview her. That would probably be wise. Yes. I wonder if she has <laughs> Audible on I'm not sorry. yet i no. asked you need I'm, audible I'm, I'm obsessed with audible well, that that's how i get through all my books yeah. because There's i go no to the way. gym yeah and like i i don't know if you read graham hancock or any of these guys and like it's just sometimes it's a bit dry yeah and like and i'm terrible at reading because like i like to wake up at five 
Yeah. I'm in my bed at nine. If I read three pages, you're out. I'm out. <laughs> so. Yeah, I'm the same. So I, I'm, yeah, I as much as I love books, audio has changed the game for me. I'm getting through like yeah. one book every two weeks now before yeah. it could be like one a year. Yeah. Just because I don't have the time. Yeah. No, it's all for me. It's listen. It's while I'm driving, doing the school run or having a walk or even when I'm at home or it's just as I can, I can multitask. Like I'm doing something like I'm on the computer, but I'm also listening to an audiobook. And you can always go back a chapter and absolutely, and, which is nice as well. That's kind of what I do. I try to go like three forward, one back yep. like that and jump around a bit. Yeah. yeah. No, it's changed the game for me. Okay. Well, if you have made it this far, like, subscribe, and uh, yeah, we're out. I never know how to end these, so thank you very much, Mika. Thank you.